on the plane, which is awesome, but Tyler's not here, so he doesn't get to be part of day 50. I don't know, it just seems like a big, he'll be here for day 100, I guess, so that, we'll do that then, but still kind of cool, day 50, woo! Yes, so this was day 50 of our RV10 build. Yay! We are continuing work on the tail cone and about to begin the final assembly of the tail cone. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many days I'm going to get through in this video, but I'll update the text down below to let you know. Before we get going, I wanted to say a quick thank you to Kevin B, Chad F, Robert P, and Tim S. Thank you guys for submitting the referral forms to Vans, and congratulations on the purchase of your new M kits. I really appreciate it. If any of the rest of you have found my videos to be helpful or informative, and you're considering purchasing an RV, any model, from Vans, please consider going to the link below for plainlady.com slash referral and submitting that form to Vans when you purchase your M kit. It doesn't cost you do anything extra but they will send me a hundred dollars as a thank you and it means a lot to me to know that you guys appreciate these videos so let's get to the build we're starting off today by actually going back to 10-2 step one where it says to tap the tie down bar um I'm having to go back because I didn't actually have a tap set at the time that we were there starting uh, section 10 for the tail cone and the one I'd ordered had arrived. So I set about trying to tap the piece, um, but this was the first time doing so. I had used some wood blocks to clamp the tie down into the vise without scuffing it or damaging it. I didn't want to apply too much force and like distort the hole that was there or have the uh, teeth there on the vise uh, scratch it. Uh, and so this worked out really well with the wood blocks, but the big thing is I kind of wish I'd watched some more videos on how to tap it the first time. Um, the big thing was don't try to tap it all at once. Like I went and got it in there and just kind of kept going and screwing it in and that's wrong. <laughs> uh, you're apparently supposed to kind of like get it started a little bit and then back it out. So kind of like a two steps forward, one step back sort of thing. Um, again, this was my first time. Go, f go look out there. You can find other videos on how to do it. Um, but don't basically just don't try and do it all the way. The first time you go a little in, a little out. Um, and once, <laughs> you know, once I got that figured out, it worked a lot easier on the next two that we did later. So the audio quality wasn't really good here and I wanted to just come in and make sure that you guys could hear what I was saying. Um, on 10-15 step seven, it says to dimple all of the number 40 holes in the F1012B bulkhead, but don't dimple the flange holes. It doesn't say that in the instructions there, but on the next page, 10-16 step four, um, it goes over uh, in the instructions there, which holes to dimple in the flanges of several parts. And that F1012B is one of them. So uh, I just wanted to like point that out because it wasn't super clear to me at the time reading it. But so on 10-15 step seven, uh, just dimple the holes on the web. Don't do any of the flange holes yet uh, until you get to the next page in step four. Why? Why are there so many little tight spaces? These are the two F1055 rotor stop skin stiffeners, and they're supposed to be dimpled on the six holes that will face the, the skin, as seen on 10 8 figure 3. The problem is that this little last one is so close to the bend that. I fear when I try to do this, I'm going to paint the stiffener. So, uh, I'm trying to think of what options I have. 
So I tried a couple of different things to get those dimples there on those holes there at the, the forward end. And I tried our uh, close quarters dimple die set, and that still was too wide. And I tried our tight fit dimpling feature that we got from Cleveland Tool, and that still didn't fit in there. So uh, this was still kind of early on in the build there with it still being in the EMP kit, and I didn't want to screw something up. So I decided to wait and call Vans and uh, got through the tech support there, and I forget which gentleman I spoke with, but... Um, the suggestion that I got was either I could go and get these small diameter female dimple dies, um, or I guess just because of the, the size there of the piece and that it's there on the end, that I could go ahead and use the regular uh, dimple dies that I had, and knowing that it was going to kind of kink that one flange out a little bit, and then just go and try and bend it back into place. So... At the time, we didn't have those small diameter female dimple dies, and so I went ahead and just used what we had. And you can see here in the video, just like the guy uh, mentioned that who I talked to at Vans, even though it did kink out that one flange a little bit because the dies were a little bit wider um, than the, the little spot I had to work in there, it was easy to just go and bend it back into place afterwards. We didn't have any problem. You really couldn't see the difference, so uh, that did work. That being said, if you've got some money in your tool budget and you're planning to go ahead and do the slow build on the wings and the fuselage, I'd probably recommend to just go ahead and get the uh, two small diameter uh, female dimple dies. We went ahead and got the ones for the 332nd and the 1 8 inch uh, rivets. And we've definitely gone ahead and used both of those already throughout the rest of the build. So... Uh, that's my two cents. If, if you got the money in your tool budget and you know you're going to be doing the slow build, you know, not a bad thing to go ahead and just get. The next night I was back out there and countersinking some of the parts, dimpling some of the parts, just some of the smaller pieces. The first step actually on 10-16 was to countersink the Longerons, but um, just I knew I didn't have a lot of time that night to be working out there, so I just grabbed some of the smaller parts there, like the tie down and a couple of brackets, and worked on some countersinking and dimpling. Pretty easy, nothing really stands out as having been too crazy out there. Uh, really straightforward. Um, yeah, I, I guess the only thing is, again, here's where little wood blocks come in handy. We're using that to prop up the tie-down bar to do the countersinking on the backside. So looking back on these videos and all of the countersinking that's going on, um, I thought of something that I do differently now than I did back here in the videos. I'm not sure if you've noticed, and I think I mentioned it maybe before, but when I was doing the countersinking previously, I was using this scrap from our uh, airfoil kits that we'd made before starting the build um, and using those, drilling some different holes in them and using it to kind of test where the countersink was set. And uh, so that's like sometimes you'll see in the corner, I'm over there working on it with the countersink. It's because I'm trying to check and see, well, what's it set to and um, making sure that it's set properly. And so one thing that uh, like I've done differently now that, that we talked about is I, I, so two, it's like two things, I guess, technically. One is I went and I counted exactly how, like what the difference was between the setting for having the countersunk or the countersink cutter set to the right depth so that a rivet, a countersunk rivet is flushed with whatever piece I'm countersinking. And the setting on that micro stop, if I'm trying to set the countersink, to cut it where it will receive a dimpled skin. So hopefully that makes sense. So the difference between if I'm just trying to countersink a piece to have a rivet head sit into it flush, or if I'm trying to countersink a piece to receive a piece of dimpled skin for a, a countersunk rivet. And so for example, like on the number 40 rivets, I know that's 10 teeth. And so what I mean by 10 teeth, I guess, is that if I pull down on the sleeve on the uh, micro stop and I, I pick like one of the teeth on there to like fix on, then when I rotate the, um, the top part there of that micro stop, if I were to rotate it, 
uh, by like counting 10 teeth over that that it's a 10 tooth difference between the having it counter uh, having it set to countersink for flush for a rivet versus having it set to countersink for flush to a dimpled skin. So hopefully that makes sense. And so that's something like I have and that I've written down. And so instead of trying to go and keep testing every time I'm trying before I go to countersink um, and trying to check and see what the micro stop set to, uh, I now, one, we've gotten multiple micro stops. So we have, I think like four now, and I have some that are, I have one dedicated for a number 40, uh, countersink cutter, one for a number 30, one for the number eight screws. And I think the fourth one is kind of just like a flex. I can put whatever I need to in it. But by having the ones that are now devoted for number 40, number 30, and number eight, what I do is I leave them set for, um, to countersink where it's flush for receiving uh, a rivet, or in the case of the number eight screw, flush for receiving the countersunk head of the, I mean, like number eight screw. And I put a little piece of blue painter's tape on it uh, and leave it on there so that I know when I reach into our little uh, tools and I pull it out, I know that it's set for uh, countersinking it for a countersunk rivet head or a screw. It is not set to countersink for dimpled skin. And so the thing is that by putting the tape on there, uh, it serves like one as a reminder, but two, by having the tape on there, you can't separate the sleeve uh, to then try and adjust the setting, like adjust the depth there on the micro stop. So I know it can't be tweaked. And if I need to tweak it, so I'm trying to set it so that now it can receive uh, like dimpled skin, then I have to take the tape off. So it will no longer say that it's set for um, making it flush for the rivets. And so what I'll do is I'll go and then tweak it to be set for having, uh, to countersink for dimpled skin. But then when I'm done with it, I will go and twist it back again. Like for example, with the number 40, set it back 10 teeth. And then I know that now it's set properly for, um, for countersinking for the rivet heads. And then I can put my tape back on there. So the, the bottom line is that instead of having to test it every time when I go and grab one of the countersinks or one, to go and do the countersink and I grab one of the micro stops, I know that at least for the number 40, the number 30, and I think the number eight, that there it's already set for receiving the rivets or the screws. And knowing that and then having counted and written down like how many teeth different it is for trying to have it receive uh, dimpled skin, I can then take that tape off, tweak it as I need to, but by resetting it there at the end, I always know what I'm getting when I pull it out of our, um, out of our tools. So it's, it's like a little thing that has just made a bit of a difference. Again, we have four micro stops now, so you could just use a one micro stop, but the thing is that for in some of these parts, you're having to countersink for number 30s and for number 40s. So you would put the number 40 countersink cutter in there. You'd set it to the right setting uh, for the depth. You'd go into your countersinking, but then you have to pop that countersink cutter out, put the number 31 in there, and then set it and... You know, then so next time you do it, you've got to keep resetting everything over and over again versus having it this way where I have like some dedicated ones for the most commonly used cutters that we have um, and knowing what the difference is between them. It's like it's just a little thing that I found has made it a bit easier for us. So I just figured I'd pass that along instead of having to keep tweaking it every time you go and do the countersinking. It's just nice to be able to reach over and grab it and know um, what it's set to and to be able to kind of just like get started right away. All right, so now it is time to start dimpling the uh, side skins there for the tail cone. And um, most of the holes, there's not a problem. You still have to make sure to go and tape off uh, a handful there that are, um, I think again, that's 10-25, the figure there where it tells you don't dimple them because the they're uh, holes for the fairings. Um, but so the, the, the one like kind of tricky spot on here was 
on the curved side of the curved edge there of the skins because <clears throat> you can reach everything along the edges with a squeezer you can reach everything there on the large flat part very easily with the drdt2 but in the holes there along that curve and there's only a handful on each of them um as you can see here like i can't get the uh, the squeezer to work and get around that curve and put the dimples in, um, even with the lingeron yoke, it just, it, 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 one, either the, the throat wasn't long enough there on the yoke to get around it, but two, it was just kind of starting to, uh, like just not sit right where it would have put the dimple in properly on the skin. I don't know if that makes sense, but, um, Anyway, the squeezer wouldn't work. So we got out the DRDT2 and there's like one way you can make it work. So uh, to try and get in there and get the, that curved part. If you try and do it uh, straight on, like uh, let's see here you can see where I've got the curved part closest to the DRDT2. If you try and do it straight on, that handle there is gonna whack the skin. If you flip it upside down like this and you try and have the curve down, that curve part is gonna hit on the inside there of the DRDT2 and it's gonna flex that curve on the skin while you're trying to dimple it. But if you come in like this here at a bit of an angle, then what you're able to do is still get the holes lined up on the dimple dies, but now you have the space to maneuver that handle to be able to go and set those dimples. So that was just something that uh, was the way we figured out to kind of work around it and uh, worked out just fine. It just took, again, a little finagling, a little bit of trial and error to figure out what was the way that we needed to, what we needed to do to get those dimples set in there. But once we figured it out, I mean, easy peasy, no problems, didn't have any issues with it, um, made quick work of those holes in there. So you can see here we're going and dimpling the side skins and something I want to remind you of that we had forgotten is to make sure this is where you want to use that edge forming tool uh, along the edge of the side skins that's going to rest upon both, I think it's the F1078 and 1079 bottom skins. So the larger bottom skin and then the smaller curved part uh, where the tie down goes through it. Um, but along that, the edge that's on the curved part of the skin to go ahead and put, um, to put, use that uh, edge forming tool and put that little slight bend in it just so that it sits uh, nice and uh, flat against the uh, the bottom of the plane. I had not remembered to do that, um, and it's a lot harder, in my opinion, to have to go back and go and use that edge forming tool in between each of those little holes uh, individually uh, once they're already dimpled, because when it's dimpled, you can't just run that uh, tool all the way along the edge. You have to go and open and close it around uh, each little dimpled hole so that's kind of a pain in the butt so before you go and dimple the whole rest of the skin i'd recommend making sure to use that uh that little edge forming tool um along that the bottom edge there of both of those side skins uh where it's going to sit on both of the bottom skins just to make sure it sits nice and flush the other thing is, as you can see here, like I hadn't made those tables for the DRDT2 yet at this point. Um, <laughs> honestly, just go ahead and make them. Like we thought that this worked fine with like the little basket and everything, but you can see it's like sliding. It's not perfect. Just go ahead and make them. I didn't make the ones exactly like per the plans that came with the DRDT2, but I just made two little individual ones that I could put one on either side. And then like, especially with the wing skins or where it gets longer, or like you can see here where there's a lot hanging off the edge, I can now put two on one side or have one on either side um either way that i mean personally for me that just is what worked out well for us the other thing is uh this is a great place to use the wood from your crates to make the table so especially with the price of wood being what it is right now in 2021 go ahead and save yourself a little bit of cash and just use the wood from the crates to make the tables it worked out just fine all right, so we're continuing on with all these big skins, getting everything dimpled, and I'm gonna like really speed this up here uh, at this point, and I'm gonna cut out some of it because 
it's just repetitive. Um, it's just sitting here going and dimpling through these long flat skins. Um, the big thing is the stuff in the middle there you can see we're doing with the DRDT2. And then when you get to the edges, it was really easy to just go ahead and use the uh, pneumatic squeezer to go ahead and dimple those. But there is nothing really crazy on any of these parts, like on that a little curved section of the side skins. So I'm gonna just like zip through this a little bit. Um, and so if you don't see us dimpling every single skin, it's not that we didn't do it, it's just that it's kind of not worth showing you guys just dimpling all of these large skins. So it's the next day and now we're gonna start dimpling uh, the bulkheads and some of the other smaller pieces, uh, as well as later getting into all of the J channels. Nothing really crazy here uh, comes to mind, but the big thing is to make sure to pay attention to all of the figures in the instructions. There are some different holes that you're not supposed to dimple. So once again, just got out some of the painter's tape and went through and made sure to tape off all those holes just to prevent having a problem and then the squeezer worked out really well for um for i think all of the holes i think we we're able to reach every single one with uh one of our different yokes so when it came time to do uh, all of the J channels, the DRDT2 came in very handy. Um, it, it was nice to just uh, have like the one flange resting against the edge of the DRDT2. And if you got your you know, cadence just right, you could make quick work of dimpling all of those. Um, just don't go crazy. <laughs> you don't wanna get uh, like lose, um, your rhythm end up accidentally like punching an extra hole in there. So, um, but again, yeah, you can see the DRDT2 worked out really nicely and made quick work of dimpling all of those, uh, all those J channels. And so while Tyler's knocking that out, uh, we also didn't have the little, um, scotch Bright deburring tip. We didn't know about that yet. So I'm over here using the files to deburr all of these little flanges out by hand. So don't do that. That's going to waste your time. Get like deburr it. But if instead of using the little files, if you go and watch the video, which I'll put a link above, um, to use that little uh, scotch Bright deburring tip with the Dremel, it will make all of that go way faster. On 10-16 step seven, you have to final drill some fairly large holes into both of the F1036B battery channels. And so what I did to just try to help make sure to hold everything steady, if these were smaller holes, if this was a thinner piece, I, I might just like hold it down by hand, but it's a thicker um, piece of aluminum and you're drilling out some pretty big holes. So I just took a piece of scrap wood that I had that was about the right width clamped it down there to the edge of the table and just had the part that I needed to drill overhang the table just a little bit that was enough to just hold it steady and hold it flat so I was able to line up the drill bit um, perpendicular to the surface and make sure to get nice clean holes we are into the next day, and as you might have noticed, the lighting and clarity of the video is a lot better now. So I had upgraded our uh, camera at this point in time, so all the videos from here on out, you should see much better uh, lighting and video quality, uh, just because I'd upgraded the GoPro I'd been using um, in the garage at that point in time. <laughs> We are over here working on putting some more of the smaller uh, components together. So we've got like the uh, elevator bell crank assembly, the battery and bell crank mount, and getting uh, some other parts attached to uh, the different bulkheads there at the rear of the tail cone. And uh, one thing I will say is that the Longeron yoke came in really handy here for uh, riveting some of these parts together, especially for example, like if you're looking at the F1012A uh, and F1012B um, bulkheads that you're attaching together, uh, because there's a flange on both of those and they're sticking out in opposite directions, uh, the regular yoke wouldn't work on there. Uh, you need that Longeron yoke with the little, you know, I like to call it the little gonzo nose to be able to hook around uh, both of those flanges sticking out in opposite directions like you can see here in the video right now. 
But yeah, the Lantron yoke came in really, really handy for getting everything riveted on uh, in this part. There's also a couple different spots where you have like thicker and thinner pieces being attached to each other. And um, what I found when you're in a situation like this, what I looked up and, and found is that um, in a situation where you have two different thicknesses of material that are being riveted together, that you should put the shop head on the thicker of the two pieces. So the part you're squishing, the shop head there, that should be on the thicker side. And so then the factory head should be on the thinner side. Um, I'm not entirely sure why that is, but again, that's just what I found um, when I was doing some research into it to try and see how to do it properly. On 10-19 step one, uh, it tells you to rivet the nut plates that are used to attach the cover plates uh, to the side skins there of the tail cone. But what it doesn't have on this particular instruction is it didn't have the rivet size. And so in, in all the previous instructions at this point, like that we've been working on here around the tail cone, it had either specifically called out which rivets to use in the, uh, in the instruction itself, or it said, you know, see the rivets in figure whatnot. And so when I got here, I was like, Hmm, I don't see anything. I'm not sure what to do first. It does have it in the instructions. It's on page 10-25, figure one, which has all of the different rivets for the side skins. Uh, so it is there. It just didn't have it uh, specifically mentioned in, uh, in the instructions at that point. But uh, I didn't notice this until later. And what I did is I used the rivet gauge to help me figure out which size rivets to use. I'm pretty sure I talked in a previous video about using the rivet gauge to test the uh, the uh, height and the width of the shop heads, but I don't think we talked about yet using that center part of the rivet gauge. So I've made a little video snippet here to just kind of go over that and explain uh, how I use that to help me figure out uh, which rivets to use. Okay, so I have a little bit of scrap here just to try and help demonstrate what I'm talking about with the um, rivet gauge. So I went over, I think, in another video about using the holes and the corners to test for how fat the shop head is and how tall it is. But here in the middle, this is uh, what you can use to test to make sure you have a long enough rivet in place. So. Here, for example, this is just two scrap pieces of metal that I've got uh, Clico together just for demonstration purposes. I have a three, three, a three, three and a half, and a three, four uh, rivet in here. And so I'm gonna try and show it what I'm talking about. So if you take the rivet gauge and you line it up, let's see if I can help show you. So you see how here, that end of the rivet does not touch, uh, it doesn't touch there, see the rivet gauge? You can see there's a gap. So it's telling us that this rivet is too short. It's not long enough uh, to create the right shop head. And then this three, three and a half, if you come up, it is pretty much perfect. It is like slightly just a pinch too long, but this is what we're looking for here where that, uh, the amount of the rivet that's sticking out, uh, hits right there on that, uh, indicator on the rivet gauge. And so we're using the three because this is what, these are number, uh, these are number 40 hole, three, three and a half inch rivets. And then here you see, if I come to the three, four, you can see how that one sticks up quite a bit past um, the top there of that uh, edge. So that's telling us that this one is too long. So if I were trying to go and rivet these pieces together and I didn't know which rivet to use, you could use uh, like what length rivet, you can use this part here of the rivet gauge and test it. And so we would be using, in this case, the uh, three, three and a half rivets. So, that is how this other part of the rivet gauge works.
So hopefully that makes sense about how to use that center part there of the rivet gauge to help check the length of the rivets that you're using to make sure you've got a long enough rivet. Um, I did end up using a uh, three, three and a halfs, and that is in fact what it called for in the direction. So yay, it did work the way it was supposed to. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, it's a good thing, I think, to know in case you get to a spot where you're not sure what to use or like for some of the stuff where we're kind of figuring it out ourselves, um, where we've had to kind of make some different um, modifications that we're doing now in the fuselage, um, it's good to, to be able to know that to make sure if, you're, if you don't have any particular instructions to work from uh, to help you figure out which rivets you need to be using. One other thing here with this instruction too, is make sure you dimple the nut plates that you're gonna be attaching there to the skin because again, the skin itself is dimpled and so you need to dimple the, the nut plates to receive that dimpled skin. So just make sure to dimple those before riveting the pieces together. And I think I'm gonna wrap it up here because we're fast approaching a half hour mark on this video. So um, I think I'm gonna leave it at this. The next video um, for the build will have everything, all the bigger components coming together. So the stiffeners going onto the skins, the skins getting riveted together, uh, it's gonna be pretty cool. And I got some really neat uh, angles, I think, to show how we got it all put together and some other really neat little tips that we learned from other builders that I think will come in handy. But the next uh, next video I'm gonna be doing is next week, I will be recording the year two in review video. So if there's any questions that you have that you'd like me to try to address, please let me know, leave me a message in the comments down below and I'll do my best to get to whatever questions you have. If you're uh, not sure like what it's going to entail, I have a year one in review video that I did. Uh, I'll put a link below or above so that you guys can see that if you missed it. So if there's any questions that you have, just again, make sure to leave me a message down in the comments down below. You can also submit any questions through my website, plainlady.com. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to give me a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so for more videos like these and to follow along as we build our RV10.